So you had a lot of fun with your front page stories. Um, I'm thinking in particular of two. You wrote a story about a Maltese Falcon themed tour of San Francisco, and you wrote it in the voice of sort of <coughs> a noir novel. Right. Um, and then you wrote a story about this contest on bad writing, and you wrote it in this exquisitely terrible prose. <laughs> So I want to ask you. I did. I remember the first line though. It was the it was the best of lines. It was the worst of lines. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and that story I that story ends it out if you want that to story it. ends with a line where where somebody says, "Was that you, Dan, or was that a real frog?" <laughs> now, that's my favorite part of the piece. <laughs> I printed it out. It is the best of lines. It is the worst of lines. It is mountains of majestic purple prose. It is parody, call me Ishmael anytime, and lush, languid, lilting alliteration. It is a metaphor mixed, nay, chopped and pureed in the Cuisinart of the mind, and on and on. My favorite part of that, though, is where, where the, I, I think I write in there somewhere that the day began to wane, and I said, well, after all, it was a wany day. <laughs> <laughs> we, were reaching, we were reaching for the stars on this, on this piece. So, what makes good writing? What makes good writing? Good writing, yeah. Oh, man. What makes good writing? Um, I can't tell you, but I know it when I see it. It's one of those bizarre things. I, I don't think I can, I don't think there's a formula. There's so much good writing and so much, it, it, so much is so different. You look at one thing, one book, one essay, um, you think, wow, that's really good writing very different from the next thing you look at and where you say, wow, that's really good writing as well. But what I look for, what I think, what I think helps make good writing is a real, a real quiet elegance of, of prose. You know, mm -hmm. cut out as many adjectives as you can, as many, as many adverbs as you can, as many commas as you can, and then you're on the way, I think, to some pretty, pretty, pretty nice writing. And what makes a good story? What makes a good story? <coughs> I, can, I can address that a little bit easier. I, I, a good story, of course, it depends on your context. I mean, if you're talking about newspapers, you know, a good story is breaking news, you know. But, but in terms of uh, like a book or what I'm, what I'm after these days, a good story is something that has to have a, um, a clear narrative arc, a clear ascending narrative engine. That is to say, something that, that hooks you and you want to keep reading because you want to know where this story is going to go. Like with this, with my, my, my new book, Dead Wake, which is about the Lusitania, natural narrative arc. You get on this ship and you know something really bad is going to happen and that's, that's the arc. Um, so that's the most important thing. And, but also for me, chronology is very important. Beginning, middle, and end has to follow a particular timeline. I think that's very powerful for people. Very powerful for readers who, 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 I think people get disoriented with a lot of flashbacks and so forth. I like, I like a nice, clean, chronological progression. So how do you figure out what you're going to write a book about? Where do you find your story ideas? I'm hating this. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to give them to me. I just want to know how no, you no, have no, found no, them. No, it's just that it is so, it is really the hardest part of my, my career, is finding an idea, coming up with the next idea. Sufficiently hard that my, my great friend and publicist, Penny Simon, actually came up with a, a term to this, a phrase to describe it, where she, she says, that's when I'm in the dark country of no ideas. <laughs> and it is, it is really hard. It usually takes me about a year between the time I finish a book and the time I get an, a new idea for the next one. And it's hard because all these things have to click, has to have a narrative arc. Um, has to be something I'm going to be interested in for, for a long time. Um, it, it has to have a really rich underlying trove of archival material because if you're going to do narrative nonfiction, you've got to have the stuff. You can't go around making it up, although people try. People do make up composite characters, they make up dialogue and all that stuff. So a lot of things have to work. I, I often think that really <laughs> it's very much like very much like like finding a finding a spouse, it, it, it is. You women know this better than maybe the men, but you know you got to kiss a lot of frogs no. uh, before eventually one kisses back in a, in a good way, and, um, and that's what it's that's what it's like. It's hard. Usually it comes down to dumb luck, but but I like to think of it as structured luck because 
I try to put myself, if you will, in the way of luck. I try to, I try to read widely, promiscuously. Um, you know, if I'm traveling, I go to museums. I just, I just try to, I just try to fill my brain with things in the hopes that something will eventually, eventually click. <clears throat> so you are looking for ideas, and then how do you know that you have found one? Like I said, I'm really hating this. Um, <laughs> no, actually, you're, you're asking me fantastic, fantastic questions. How do I know when I've really found one? <sighs> that cuts into all different levels of neurosis on my part, actually. <laughs> but, but a big part of it is um, I always do, I always do uh, a test proposal, a test book proposal. With nonfiction, it's very different than with with fiction, if you're writing a novel, you have to have the novel pretty much done. You have to turn that into the editor, and they decide then whether they want it or not. Nonfiction publishers act more or less like um, like um, venture capitalists. You give it's true, it's true that you, you give them a proposal, um, and if they like the idea, they will fund your research and so forth. That's that's the advance against against royalties, and so. I always, I always do a very detailed proposal, even now at this point. Um, my agent says, well, you know, you could just write him a letter now. And I said, well, no, I, I want to do this proposal because, because it, it really tests your sense of the story. It tests whether it's going to work for you. It tests whether you're going to be able to live with it for the next four or five years. And a book proposal is, you know, an opening chapter a 10-page or so essay on what the story's about, how you're going to go about it, what's out there, and then you finish with a, with a chapter outline, which is essentially an educated guess. You kind of, you've done enough research where you try to just sort of figure out where the story's going to go in the chapter outline. And um, if you get through that whole process and you still like the project, you have a pretty good idea that it's going to work. And then if your agent and your editor say, yeah, we love this, then you, you have a very good idea that that, hey, this, this, this is something I, I'm going to be able to live with. But there's also another value to this proposal, and that is it helps keep the terror at bay. Because once you get that contract with a publisher, you've got to start working on this thing. And it's got to be a book, and it's got to, you know, probably you'll have a deadline. And so the beauty of a book proposal is as soon as you start working, you've got that outline. You know, you may depart from it a bit, but you've got that outline. You just get started. And that, that really helps also. Also, there's this thing in publishing, if, especially with a, well, nonfiction and, um, and with novels, um, the point where you have turned in what is deemed an acceptable manuscript. An acceptable manuscript. Those are the words you always want to hear from a publisher. And because at any time they can say, you know, I'm sorry, this, this, isn't, this doesn't live up to what you promised. But if you have a proposal and you followed it, you say, talk to my lawyer. You know, we'll see you in court, you know, that kind of thing. So, I'm fascinated with the research that goes into your books. Um, they have notes in the back that sort of explain for the curious reader like me where you found all this stuff. But can you walk me through sort of all the, all the archives you dig into? Is it like a treasure hunt for historical documents? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it, it is very much that. It's very much that. And, and it's actually deeply satisfying to me because it sort of fulfills my desire. I think once upon a time, well, I know, it, but once upon a time I actually entertained the idea of becoming a private investigator. I just love the quest for things. And now my research is actually, it, it very much is a quest for things that I know or feel are out there. And I just have to look and look and look until I find them. And actually that's where, I'm not sucking up to the Wall Street Journal, Believe me, because they fired me. But um, <laughs> it's a, it's a complicated. I wasn't bring it, that it was a layoff. It was a layoff. It, <laughs> in the year I was nominated for a Pulitzer by the Journal, it's, 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 I'm, I'm completely over it. It was. It's a long, sold more than five million. It was a long time ago. But anyway, was, it, one of the things that I actually did learn at the Wall Street Journal was uh, was um, the, uh, really helped develop a sense of detail and, and looking for the little little nuggets and kernels of, of, of detail that make a story really come alive. I mean, especially with the A-heads you were talking about. I mean, that's what, that's what they, they totally 
either succeeded or failed on the basis of was these perfect little details, bizarre little moments. I mean, like I remember, remember I did a, an interview with, um, with Gary Larson, the, no relation, he's the cartoonist, you know. And <laughs> I'm so tickled to learn that on the, on the day he was going for his first job, at, uh, his first job, which was a job at the uh, ASPCA, he was driving to, the, to do the interview. <laughs> he hit and killed a dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of detail. That's what I'm after. Did that make it into your story? Yes, that made it into my story. Was it your lead? No, but it was pretty close to it. There were other things that were better for the lead. So how do you even figure out that these documents are out there? Because it's not just diaries and telegrams and correspondence that you go after. It's documents that... I, I'm surprised even exists when I read about them in your notes. Well, you know, it's like anything else. You 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 start you start with the usual suspects. If I'm doing a a, a project, I, I'm I'm pretty certain that there's going to be something at the Library of Congress in Washington D.C. because mm -hmm. there's they have everything. They have every book. You know, there's there's going to be something. So you know, I'll check with the manuscript division and and you know um, uh, online, or else I'll just you know I'll parachute in and just sort of hit the Library of Congress. I mean, I'm a big believer in the idea of jump-starting things by just going and looking. <coughs> and, then, and that almost invariably leads to something. But then there are finding aids that will steer you to something else. I also know another one of the usual suspects in Washington is the National Archives. You know, if there's something in the, if there's something in the Library of Congress, I know there's also going to be something in the National Archives. I'm pretty confident. And then you go there. And then, you know, you read, you, you, you find out where other things are. Again, in the case of my Lusitania book, I knew, of course, that there'd be a lot of stuff in the United Kingdom. I didn't know there would be as much as I found, but, but you know, one step leads to another. It's like you sort of go Tarzaning from, from, from archive to archive, and, it's, and that's, that's what, I, what I love in that phase. Let's talk about the devil and the white city. So this is about a serial <coughs> killer who's sort of stalking in Chicago as the, the planners and the architects are putting together the Chicago w World's Fair of 1893, is that right? Yep. And um, it, it weaves these two narratives of, of the architects who are trying to create the world's most stupendous fair and this psychopath who's sort of stalking and killing women. Um, how did you, first of all, come up with that idea? How did you stumble across that story? This is a long story. Mm -hmm. She's, everybody should get a beer and come back. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the, the, the way it happened, actually, is it goes back to 1994. I had read a novel, um, a detective novel, a fiction, uh, called The Alienist by Caleb Carr. I don't know how many of you read it, but it was great. And the thing I loved about that book was the sense of old New York that I had after I finished reading it. I came away feeling like I had actually like been in 1890s New York. <clears throat> so I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to try to do a nonfiction book about a real life murder that had taken place in history? So, so I you were started. Looking for a murderer. What? So you were looking for a murderer. Yes, but it's more complicated than that. So I, I took out the sausage being made. I took out a book from the library called the Encyclopedia of Murder. <laughs> <laughs> started reading it at A. I don't know where I came across this guy Holmes, the serial killer in the Dome. I said it was either at H or at, at M. Mudgett, which was his real name. Did not had no interest. I, mean, I was titillated, but I didn't want to do crime porn. I wanted to do. You know, I mean, this guy was like, 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 you know, his horror hotel and burning people in acid vats and so forth. That I was not into that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Later. people change, you know. <laughs> so, 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 um, I, I, I was looking for a, a murder. I found a, a murder that seemed, on the face, sort of interesting, but it was just, it wasn't really, it wasn't really doing much for me. Um, and then, um, in the course of the research, I opened the, a, a copy of the New York World. See, this is a long, this is the great circle route to answer your question. I opened the New York World from like the 1890s and saw a headline about a hurricane that said like, you know, 2,000 people dead. And it was, it was the New York World again. And I thought, ah, you know, yellow journalism. Because I was a real hurricane junkie, I grew up on Long Island and love hate thing. Grew up in a glass house surrounded by tall trees. Really, totally, <laughs> totally screwed me up for life. 
So, so then I, and that got me so sidetracked, that became my book, Isaac Storm. And then when Isaac Storm was done, I was once again just sort of high and dry. I was back in that, that dark country of no ideas. I was trying to think, well, what am I going to do? The idea of a murder again came to me. I thought about, actually thought about Holmes, dismissed him again. But I had remembered that in the course of reading about Holmes, there was a glancing reference to the World's Fair of 1893. I had never heard anything about it. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll start reading about the World's Fair of 1893. I had nothing else to do. Went to my library in Seattle at the University of Washington Susalo Library. It turns out they had a lot of stuff on the, on the World's Fair of 1893. Much to my surprise, I'd never heard of it. So what, what's all this stuff doing in a Seattle library? You know what I mean? <laughs> And I can tell you that, that the moment I started reading about this, and, and one of my things when I'm, when I'm reading other people's work on subjects, I always go to the footnotes first, because that's where the good stuff, frankly, usually is, especially with academic histories. They tend to write very boring stuff, and all the sex is in the footnotes. That's the, <laughs> truly, that's where the best stuff is. So in a footnote in one of the books, <laughs> there was this reference to, of all things, this is the trigger. This was the specific trigger for Juicy Fruit the fulcrum upon which my life subsequently spun, which was that Juicy Fruit Gum was introduced to consumers at the World's Fair of 1893. <laughs> now, <laughs> that may not seem to most of you like a momentous moment, but for me, I was a passionate chewer of Juicy Fruit Gum. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, my God, this stuff is 100 years old, you know? <laughs> and, and something about that just, wow. And I started reading more and more into the World's Fair, and I realized all this stuff, like, like the zipper, you know, was first introduced to shredded people. Wheat? Sh shredded wheat. Shredded wheat. Shredded wheat. I mean, this is like one of the most amazing things, right? <laughs> and the Ferris wheel. That was the most amazing thing. I had no idea. And who, who knew? Who knew that this Ferris wheel was named for a guy named Ferris? You know, George Washington Gale Ferris. I always thought it was Ferrous, like iron, F-E-R-R-O-U-S. <laughs> anyway, it became just this delight. But I realized really within the first 24 hours of, of reading about the fair, I realized that the book I wanted to do was going to have the killer and the fair, that it was going to be about both, because how amazing was it that you had this fair and literally almost in the same place, blocks away, this killer who was using the fair as a lure, this, this monument to darkness, the monument to, to civic goodwill, juxtaposed against one another, same place, same time. The title came to me in the first 24 hours, Devil in the White City, and stuck ever since. Now, I will say that on the eve of publication of that book, I was convinced that my career was over. Why? Because this book broke all the rules of, of narrative. That is to say, the two stories never touched. That is to say, they never, you know, like Burnham never said, oh, oh who's killing these women? And you know, Holmes never said, hey, who's that guy Burnham? You know, there's no connection, you know what I mean? Although he was taking advantage of all the yeah, 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 goers. The, yeah, the, the, yes, but, but you know, there was no like, interaction like with characters interacting and so forth. There, there is one point, actually, where the two stories really do quite literally converge. But, but I was really worried about that. I was, I was certain that reviewers were just like, oh my god, what's, what a mess, you know? Um, they saved that for one of my later books, actually. But, but, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> But so that's, that's how that all came about. And then it just became a question of trying to find enough material about both to, to make the story work. One thing I find really interesting about the material that you gathered for that book is that you had access to a memoir that the serial killer himself wrote. Yes. However, it's clear to you and, and you explained to us in the book that he has not told the truth in large portions of this memoir. He is the definition of an unreliable narrator. So how did you grapple with, with using this memoir, but at the same time acknowledging that a lot of this stuff is made up? Well, try, well made up is a strong word for, for Holmes. Rather, it was more like he was dodging the truth and giving us just enough to suggest that there was a darker, darker truth. Mm -hmm. And that also that there were certain things that he, even he was, well, he was really sort of he had trouble, for example, articulating the fact that that dead people were like dead people in bodies. In, in the memoir, he referred to it all, people, corpses, as the material. Right. Which is, that tips you off to something right there, you know. <laughs> but, but, 
the, 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 his, 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 his memoir was one element um, of, of the story that when you triangulate with everything else, the evidence that came out at the, the trial in Philadelphia, um, the evidence that came out in the press after the revelations about this hotel. I mean, it was day after day, it's hard to believe actually, day after day after day of really detailed reporting, people coming forward with letters from their lost loved ones and so forth, to the point where, you know, for the first week or so, probably for the first two weeks in the Chicago Tribune, you would have about seven pages of the Chicago Tribune, full pages, full pages devoted to this case. Just page after page after page with all kinds of cool stuff. So you have that. Um, and when you put it all together, you, you, you can, you can, you know, you, I found I could use the memoir recognizing that we're all seeing this thing as, you know, a lie, but with enough truth in it to be very interesting. Like when he's talking about his insurance fraud where he, you know, he faked the death of somebody by using a cadaver. Oh, no. No, he actually killed that person, but that's you know that's in the footnotes. But, but anyway, no. So, so, but by a process of triangulation, I think you can come to a pretty good sense of what's good about the memoir and what's not so good. Same thing happened with his multiple confessions. You had to be very careful to, to see where he was where he was dodging the truth to himself and actually to to outsiders, and where he was actually, at that point, getting into a grand uh, making his making his. His evil acts seem even bigger, <laughs> which is another weird part. There are a couple scenes in that book where, based on your research, you describe what you believe is the, the likeliest scenario. Um, right. You sort of speculate on the details right. of a couple of murder scenes. Right. And I wonder, did you have any qualms about sort of crossing that line from abject fact to speculation? Yes. Mm -hmm. But here's how I dealt with it. <clears throat> I wanted to give readers a sense of, of what was happening in those two murder scenes. I think you're talking about two, two, two murder scenes in particular. So I knew that there was enough information. There was a lot of information about what actually happened, but nobody was actually in the rooms, rooms with, these, with these people. But I decided to take the approach that, that an attorney, that a prosecuting attorney would take in a court of law. Um, you know, you, you as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney, you take the available evidence and you create a plausible story to make all that evidence fit, right? The thing I did, though, that makes me maybe feel much more confident about that technique, I don't, I don't like that technique. I don't, I, 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 frankly, I, I won't ever do it again. I didn't, I didn't like it then, I didn't like it, I don't like it now, never again. But what I did do was in the footnotes, I made it very transparent what I was doing, how I was doing it, what resources I was doing it with, so that you could draw your own conclusions. Leonardo DiCaprio has acquired the film rights to that book. What's the update on that project? <laughs> it's, it's Hollywood. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that, you know, the, the, the option is still live. It's still moving forward. Um, so also is the Tom Hanks option on Garden of Beasts. They're all progressing slowly. My sense is that in ho with Hollywood and books and so forth, that, that a book either becomes a book immediately with lightning speed, like Cheryl Strayed's book, you know, Wild. I mean, it, it either happens like immediately or it just, you know, you die before the thing comes out. <laughs> so. Um, let's talk about your new I, sh book. I should explain my philosophy, by the way. Uh, the one reason I, I'm not that up on what the status is of, of the various options is that, I, I, although I do know that they're, they're live and, and uh, um, everybody seems to be moving ahead, is that I, have, I, I follow the Tom Wolfe approach to, uh, to dealing with Hollywood. And I'm paraphrasing this badly, but he said, you know, you take your book to the fence, hand it over, take the bag of money, and run. <laughs> and that's, so. Um, I'd love you to read a little bit from your new book. This is called Dead Wake, The Last Crossing of the Lusitania. So my big fear was that the first reviewers would be like, dead weight, you know, and, <laughs> and, and things like that. Oh boy, this book was torpedoed from the get-go, you know, and all that stuff. I'm going to read something very short. This, this is actually the, 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 uh, um, the prologue. Um, 
Who likes that cover? I love that cover. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is called A Word from the Captain. It's a prologue. Uh, <coughs> on the night of May 6th, 1915, as his ship approached the coast of Ireland, Captain William Thomas Turner left the bridge and made his way to the first class lounge, where passengers were taking part in a concert and talent show, a customary feature of Cunard crossings. The room was large and warm, paneled in mahogany and carpeted in green and yellow, with two 14-foot-tall fireplaces in the front and rear walls. Ordinarily, Turner avoided events of this kind aboard ship because he disliked the social obligations of captaincy. But tonight was no ordinary night, and he had news to convey. There was already a good deal of tension in the room, despite the singing and piano playing and clumsy magic tricks, and this became more pronounced when Turner stepped forward at intermission. His presence had the perverse effect of affirming everything the passengers had been fearing since their departure from New York in the way that a priest's arrival tends to undermine the cheery smile of a nurse. It was Turner's intention, however, to provide reassurance. His looks helped. With the physique of a bank safe, he was the embodiment of quiet strength. He had blue eyes and a kind and gentle smile, and his graying hair, he was 58 years old, <coughs> conveyed wisdom and experience, as did the mere fact of his being a Cunard captain. In accord with Cunard's practice of rotating captains from ship to ship, this was his third stint as the Lusitania's master, his first in wartime. Turner now told his audience that the next day, Friday, May 7th, the ship would enter waters off the southern coast of Ireland that were part of the, quote, zone of war, end quote, designated by Germany. This in itself was anything but news. On the morning of the ship's departure from New York, a notice had appeared on the shipping pages of New York's newspapers. Placed by the German embassy in Washington, it reminded readers of the existence of the war zone and cautioned that, quote, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or of any of her allies are liable to destruction, end quote, and that travelers sailing on such ships, quote, do so at their own risk, end quote. Though the warning did not name a particular vessel, it was widely interpreted as being aimed at Turner's ship, the Lusitania. And indeed, in at least one prominent newspaper, the New York World, it was positioned adjacent to Cunard's own advertisement for the ship. Ever since, about all the passengers have been doing was, quote, thinking, dreaming, sleeping, and eating submarines, end quote, according to Oliver Bernard, a theater set designer traveling in first class. Turner now revealed to the audience that earlier in the evening, the ship had received a warning by wireless of fresh submarine activity off the Irish coast. He assured the audience there was no need for alarm. Coming from another man, this might have sounded like a baseless palliative, but Turner believed it. He was skeptical of the threat posed by German submarines, especially when it came to his ship, one of the great transatlantic greyhounds, so named for the speeds they could achieve. His superiors at Cunard shared his skepticism. The company's New York manager issued an official response to the German warning. Quote, the truth is that the Lusitania is the safest boat on the sea. She is too fast for any submarine. No German war vessel can get her or near her. Turner's personal experience affirmed this. On two previous occasions, while captain of a different ship, he had encountered what he believed were submarines and had successfully eluded them by ordering full speed ahead. He said nothing about these incidents to his audience. Now he offered a different sort of reassurance. Upon entering the war zone the next day, the ship would be securely in the care of the Royal Navy. He bade the audience good night and returned to the bridge. The talent show continued. A few passengers slept fully clothed in the dining room for fear of being trapped below decks in their cabins if an attack were to occur. One especially anxious traveler, a Greek carpet merchant, put on a life jacket and climbed into a lifeboat to spend the night. Another passenger, a New York businessman named Isaac Lehman, took a certain comfort from the revolver that he carried with him always and that would, all too soon, bring him a measure of fame and infamy. With all but a few lights extinguished and all shades pulled and curtains drawn, the great liner slid forward through the sea, at times in fog, at times under a lacework of stars. But even in darkness, in moonlight and mist, the ship stood out. At one o'clock in the morning, Friday, May 7th, the officers of a New York-bound vessel spotted the Lusitania and recognized it immediately as it passed some two miles off. Quote, you could see the shape of the four funnels, said the captain, Thomas M. Taylor. Quote, she was the only ship with four funnels, end quote. Unmistakable and invulnerable, a floating village in steel, the Lusitania glided by in the night as a giant black shadow cast upon the sea. And then the book starts. <laughs> I just want to ask one question about this before we open it up to the audience. Sure. 
You get inside the heads of both the Lusitania's captain and the German U-boat captain. How did you do that? Well, now you say I get inside their heads, but at no point do I really say, like, he was thinking this, he was this, this, and this. I have information from each guy that tells us what they were thinking. Like we had, um, in the case of the, one of the wonderful things about this, this archival body of information in, in the, in, on the Lusitania, um, was the, the fact that the, the submarine captain had, um, as all submarine captains, all U-boat captains did, he kept a war log. That is, it was uh, essentially a war diary of his, um, of his patrols. So here's this document that essentially records his voyage from the day he left Germany over the north of Ireland on down and all the way into the Irish Sea, which was a voyage that was just so disheartening for this poor guy. I think readers are actually going to find that, that, uh, that Captain Schweiger is actually a very um, sympathetic character. It's a horrible patrol. The weather sucked. He was chased by, chased by destroyers for an inordinate amount of time. Every time he came up on the other, on the, on the, um, on the west side of Ireland, there was fog, fog, fog. His torpedoes failed, um, it failed routinely. One of the interesting things I found in the course of the research for this book is that uh, according to a German uh, uh, tally, 60% of torpedoes failed. They were fired or unfired or broke or jumped out of the water and in one case even actually almost circled back and almost hit the submarine. But they were 60% <laughs> failed. So here's this poor guy with this thing, and this, this, but this gave me real insights into, into him. I don't talk about, I don't say, oh, he was, he was saying to himself, this is a dismal cruise. I'm saying this was a dismal cruise. And, you know, you can, I think you can be pretty confident that it was. And then he talks a little bit, it, 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 he, one of his friends in the submarine service, uh, Max Valentiner, um, said to be an utterly ruthless submarine commander, was a friend of this guy Schweiger, and Schweiger um, talked to him at some length about about this this voyage, this patrol, which then Valentiner subsequently put into a, a memoir of his of his own. Um, so you have a sense of what he's thinking there. Turner was a lot tougher. Um, the only thing I can do with uh, with Turner, the only thing I did with Turner in the book, is 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 essentially place him in the bridge and detail detail the things that were coming at him, so that we can sort of come to terms with, or we can imagine what he's, what he's thinking. I don't say that he's thinking, oh man, I'm in deep, you know, um, but, but he was, you know, and it's obvious if you just lay out the facts, like he gets this warning, he gets this warning, and here he is, he's got, he's got, he's got, he's got a, a report that there are submarines ahead of him, he's got a report that there are submarines behind him, you know, and this is an extraordinary moment for him um, because this is unprecedented in the history of submarine warfare. Yeah, so.